Major support for these broadcasts is provided by New York Community Bank, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Chelsea Lighting, Capital One Bank, Perfect Building Maintenance, Genova Burns, Gian Tomasi and Webster, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, The Wickhoff Group, Greenberg Traurig, LLP, m and Bank. Additional support is provided by Ackman Ziff Real Estate Group, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Briarwood Organization, Bruce Mosler, C.B. Richard Ellis, Colliers International, New York, LLC, Cushman and Wakefield, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, Levine Builders, DDG Partners, Friedman LLP, Accountants and Advisors, Flushing Bank, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Center at Syracuse University, James Orfanides, Centurion Holdings, John Katsimatidis, Red Apple Group, Madison Realty Capital, Margolin Weiner and Evans, LLP, Certified Public Accountants and Business Advisors, Massey Knackle Realty Services, New Banks, Meridian Capital Group, Newmark Knight Frank, Sterling and Sterling, SJP Properties, Stonehenge Partners, and These Friends. It's surprising, but 300,000 men each year are diagnosed with prostate cancer, and about 40,000 die each year. Today, I have a friend who's a world-renowned leader in the treatment of prostate cancer, and it's a very interesting life story to tell the life story of Dr. Herb Lepore, who's the chairman of the Department of Urology, who's the Martin Spatz professor uh, at the NYU Langone Medical Center and NYU School of Medicine. Thanks for being here today. Michael, my pleasure. You know, when you and I got together, I, I was a little surprised to find out that you were born and you, in Sheepshead Bay. So tell me a little bit about your mother and father and how they came over. So my mom and dad, my dad actually was born in Romania. And I, I'm sure that my grandparents... Uh, who embe they embellished the story as they escaped from the uh, so, from the so Russians. Tell me, so tell me the story <laughs> as they told you. So my grandmother, the, the soldiers came, uh, and allegedly my grandmother got the soldiers drunk, uh, and then they escaped through the mountains. They left, uh, and this must have been in the 19 uh, early, like probably about 1919, 1920. So they got to Romania, and that's where my father was born, uh, and then they eventually. Uh, were able to come to uh, America when my dad was a year, uh, and my mom, uh, she her her parents uh, came to uh, uh, America a couple years earlier, so she was actually born in in, in Brooklyn. Now, where was where were her parents from? So they're both both sides were from U Ukraine, from uh, from from Russia. Now you now you tell me a little bit about your your dad. You said your dad. We'll talk about his education, but your mother and dad met at a dance, you had said. That, yeah, right? so again, it was uh, two couples. So uh, my mom went with her girlfriend, and my dad went with uh, his friend. Uh, and the way they were initially supposed to be teamed up was my mom with my dad's friend. Uh, and somehow, as they were sort of getting ready to the dance floor, my father sort of nudged the other guy out. Uh, obviously had an eye for my mom. And my mom says she was such a quiet young lady. And my dad was a bit more outgoing. And as they tell the story, he was sitting there with his big cigar, 
blowing it in everybody's face with a, I guess that must have been a nickel Coca-Cola then or something. Uh, and somehow my mom was surprised uh, that she fell for him, but was a little bit uh, concerned, you know, when uh, he came over for the, for the first date. But he was a total gentleman. And I think at that time it was Pesach, so they were going to get a, a dress for my mother together with her mother. And he was a perfect gentleman, and the rest so was now, history. So they got married. They lived in Brooklyn? Brooklyn. So they, they lived in Brooklyn. And you, tell me, you, your father went to uh, college in uh, New York City, right? right? He went to City College of New York. Uh, City College Uptown yep. at that time. I guess. In the Heights. <laughs> right. No, in the Heights. It must because, be. Right, because... Uh, you, because you could educate me. Right, he bit. went to City College Uptown. And, and then and for his math, and then he did his physics uh, at, at NYU. And he was getting pretty close to getting his, uh, uh, his Ph.D., but then the kids started coming, uh, and then he went to work in the Brooklyn Naval Shipyard. Right, you told me the Naval Yard, and you, you have a, what do you have, five? So I have four brothers and a sister. Just to show the so I was the last one born in New York, and then we moved to San Diego. Now, your, your dad was, you said he worked in the Brooklyn Navy Yard, and his, they moved to San Diego because he was a specialist in acoustics, right? Right. It's sort of noise control. So when, for his first 10 years in San Diego, his job was to try to, with the aircraft, he worked for General Dynamics. So he, his job was to sort of uh, insulate with some of these noise proofing um, equipment, uh, the airplanes. And then he took a, civ he was a civilian working in Point Loma in San Diego for the Naval Undersea Research and Development. So there his job was to try to make it, because of sound, to try to make it so the submarines would not be uh, detected by, by the Russians and their, their sonar. And he got a, uh, I, I have the picture today where he got a presidential uh, citation for the, the work that he did uh, as a civilian scientist uh, for the for the Navy. And of course, my mother always said we had the noisiest house, right? You grew up in Brooklyn. Did your grandparents, your, your mother and your father, mother and pa uh, father's parents remain in Brooklyn when you moved to San Diego? Right. So they all stayed in, in Brooklyn. Eventually, um, probably my, my grandparents on my dad's side both lived into their 90s. And I would say when they were sort of in their early 80s, then they actually moved to San Diego. So by then, you know, I had already, I was in college, so well, I didn't gonna, spend a lot of time. to get to your education. Right. But so they were, uh, but my, 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 f my grandfather on my mother's side, I never knew. Uh, he passed away. He was, uh, I think, uh, uh, a glazer or something. Uh, and he just one day went into work and passed, passed away. So here we are. You're in San Diego. You're the youngest of six. Right. Uh, no, I'm the middle. Middle uh, you're of the, six. In the middle, middle of six, six. but the, there, there, uh, you know, uh, there's five boys and one. Five boys and. And you girl. told me that when you were growing up, uh, we'll, we'll get to your job in a second. But one of the things that got you interested in medicine, because always something right. happens besides the fact that. Was well, a were, Jewish you, boy. You were Jewish, right? There's, there's, Jewish no, there's, boy. There's, 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 there's no other <laughs> choice was that you had a brother who had heart surgery, right? Right, my brother Norm, we're, we're very close to this day. And he ended up having a patent ductus, which today would be very simple, right? But in those days, uh, even surgical correction of this lesion was, uh, was a fairly uh, uh, risky uh, and sort of in its infancy with the, with the heart surgery. So he must have been about three so I was six years of age, uh, and we were getting very close. And, and so that, you know, just sort of that, that whole uh, experience, having really no understanding for the, really the magnitude of his, his problem, but sort of being involved uh, in the process, I think was sort of sealed the deal, at least for me early on, that this was, uh, that this, that my interest paralleled my parents' wishes. <laughs> Now, you said to me when you were growing up um, in San Diego, you went to public school. Right. And one of the jobs, which people will definitely int int be interested, is that you, uh, you worked, uh, it's, people in this part of the country right. don't know what Farrell's is. <laughs> Farrell's but but Farrell's was a West Coast, I think right. San Francisco-based. Yeah. 
Probably started there and worked his way down to uh, Southern California. And so, t what were you what were you doing I, at Farrell's? I was a busboy, and so I picked up a few extra dollars. Uh, as soon as I turned sixteen and had the the keys to the to to the car, uh, and usually on on the weekends and one evening. And as a busboy, of course, you had to bust the tables, but you had to carry what was called the zoo, and appropriate for the San Diego Zoo, right? And I believe this was a huge basin. I think of in, <laughs> in New York, what happened is we had Jans. Yeah. And, and Jans, as opposed to the zoo, right. it was called the kitchen sink. Okay, so that's The kitchen right, sink right, with literally. 22 flavors right. and whipped cream yeah. and everything yeah. else. Right? And, and the sirens would go off, and you had to run through all the tables and eventually carry this zoo. Uh, back to the to the table and and hopefully without ever having been tripped because of course every uh, prankster their goal was to nail the poor bus boy who so, was so, carrying. So them. I have a question: Did you Did I ever drop it? No, but I came very close one time. So you graduated high school and right. then where do you go to college? So I went to college at UCLA. Now. You were in San Diego. Right. Your parents let the 16-year-old kid go to UCLA in Westwood? I mean, this is a... It could have been Berkeley, right? <laughs> you know what I did? Again, I was so interested in medical school. And you know, UC San Diego was a fabulous school. But what I did is I went ahead, again, this is sort of, and I ordered many of the catalogs from the medical schools. And then I looked to see where their students came from as far as undergraduates. And really, those who seem to have the highest proportion of students in medical schools were UCLA and, and Berkeley. And while UC San Diego had a tremendous reputation, there, it just didn't seem to have that sort of national uh, reputation. So I went to UCLA at, uh, at, at, at age six. I had two brothers who were there, so I wasn't totally on my own, uh, both actually in dental school. So you're at UCLA, right. uh, pre-med. Pre-med, as I said, pre-mad, but pre-med. Pre-med, and um, what were you doing? You said to me you were doing some research programs during the summer and all that. Right, we, you know, what, I was very interested in, in chemistry. And so I was doing a lot of advanced uh, synthetic chemistry uh, as I was acquiring all of the, all the requirements for for, for medical school. So I always liked tinkering and uh, blowing things up. No, but uh, actually almost blew a lab up. But uh, it was, it was, it was, uh, it, w it was, uh, I really enjoyed the chemistry aspect. You know, how does the kid, you know, with roots on Nostrand Avenue <laughs> in Brooklyn, uh, then San Diego, then Westwood in Los Angeles, end up in uh, Johns Hopkins? Yeah, you know, it's very interesting. And student advisor, right? I remember, you know what, I remember when I was, almost like it was yesterday, when I was in junior high school and I was getting allergy shots and I had to go, you know, across town on the bus to get the shots and then, you know, back home. And I remember there was a fella at the bus stop and he's an African-American man and he said to me, he says, what do you want to do when you grow up? I said, I want to go to medical school. I want to be a doctor. He says, well, you've got to go to Johns Hopkins. <laughs> Honest to God, I was in eighth grade. So Johns Hopkins sort of resonated. But, of course, it has its reputation. And being from a, a, a family of limited means, I'd say financially, that was the only real limitation. I mean, there was unbounding uh, love and, 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 and concern uh, and, and interest. But finances were, were limited. So I never, I didn't have the finances to actually take an interview. Right, but you, you, were, you were accepted to UCLA, right. you told me. I was accepted to UCLA and UCSF and University of Chicago and, 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 and Hopkins. And I went back. So I took a regional interview. So the person who interviewed me for Johns Hopkins actually was the emeritus professor and chairman at UCLA who had did, who in fact, this, this goes this farther, who had done his urology training at Johns Hopkins. So he interviewed me at UCLA in his office, but for Johns Hopkins. And when I came back, and by then I sort of limited my, my, my options. I figured if I stay on the West Coast, I was gonna go to UC San Francisco and 
that was a top 10 ranked school, and, and Hopkins was one. So I went back uh, to Dr. Goodwin. I said, Dr. Goodwin, what do you think? Where, what should I, where should I go? You know, you know UCLA, you know Hopkins, and he says, young man, he says, you go to Johns Hopkins. He says, and when you go there, go see Pat I want Walsh. you to see Patrick C. Walsh. He just became the chairman of urology at Johns Hopkins, and I trained him here at UCLA. I didn't know urology from schmirology then. Now you go to Baltimore, right. you find out that Hopkins is in a very urban uh, neighborhood. <laughs> yes. Uh, and you go and you contact UCLA. I contacted every single school that I got accepted to, UCLA, UCSF, San Diego, and after one week of being in Baltimore, I said, can I have my spot back in California? I gotta get out of this place. And of course, they told me that it's too late, but that I could transfer back after my second year, because then you have the clinical d uh, courses, which you know you're not really limited by the classroom seats. And I said, let me tell you one thing: if I survive two years, I'm sticking it out and I'm putting it on my wall. So let's talk about the years over there, because <clears throat> the years over there have have a lot to affect that how you became a urologist right. and the study with Walsh. And let's go over the your your years. Yes, of at course school. I did. Just as I was uh, instructed by by Dr. Goodwin, I knocked on Dr. Walsh's door, and as soon as I said Dr. Goodwin sent me, it's almost like the Mashiach has sent me, right? So he quickly uh, I you know took me in, and then I said, listen, I'd like to do some research because I'd done a lot of research as a as an undergraduate. So he then put me uh, passed me on to Dr. Coffee, where I did my research. And, and during my research, two years uh, in, in doing urology, uh, well, I eventually decided to go into urology. Uh, and it was during my residency that I was involved in two projects that really sort of set the now, course. Now, well, when we were talking about this, you were saying urology is, it's internal medicine and right. it's plus. Exactly. Explain you to me, what? what do you mean by it, that? It's interesting in that when you take most specialties, right, like cardiology. You know, the cardiologist is a diagnostician, and then if there's a surgical issue, then the cardiac surgeon takes care of it. You know, sort of with GI, right? You have GI complaints, the gastro, and then they'll pass you on to the, the, surgeon. To the surgeon. But short of the kidney, so if you take the kidney, you do have the nephrologist, and that's sort of the medical doctor of the, of the kidney, and the urologist is the surgeon. But when you take the rest of the urinary tract, when you take bladder disease, when you take prostate, when you take reproductive uh, um, problems. So as a urologist, you really are the diagnostician. Uh, you're the internist of the urinary tract uh, and also the surgeon. So for example, you know, if you have an elevated PSA, you'll come to the urologist, they'll do the biopsy, if you ultimately need surgery, they'll perform the surgery, and then they will take care of you throughout the course right. of, as the, opposed, of the disease. As opposed to sending it to the right. surgeon right. Then, who, right. who has a limit. It's, it's more of a relationship, a continuation. Right. And you know, it's like the gatekeeper, as we would right. say. Yeah, you, you, but it's full service. Now, I don't think I would want to simply be an internist because I love the surgical component of the, and the surgical challenges. Uh, but if all I was is a surgeon and you lost that sort of continuity with a patient, uh, it, it, it wouldn't have the appeal. And so we interview residents. In fact, at uh, NYU, we'll have like 200 or 300 applicants. We'll interview 40, <clears throat> and eventually we'll take three a year. And if you read most personal statements, right, it's sort of that same theme, which is they were attracted to urology for the, the same reasons that, that I was. So you graduate <clears throat> Hopkins, and then you t go for your residency Correct. at Hopkins. Yes. In urology. In urology. In urology to work with Walsh. And then after two years, you do some research, right. uh, some world-renowned research. Let's right. talk about that research with the, uh, <clears throat> the cadaver. Right. So, so Walsh had just come back from Scandinavia. And at that time, again, prostate cancer surgery, there were not that many cases that were, you even had the 
possibility of curing them because in those days people did <coughs> it was a death sentence yeah when you, you were diagnosed exact when the cancer had spread so the only way you could find it early was if you did the digital rectal exam and actually you had to rely on the internist who who actually often either did perform the the exam or wasn't skilled so so it was the rare patient <coughs> who even had the opportunity to, to have a curative intervention. And almost all men were rendered impotent, the inability to have an erection. And so Walsh was uh, traveling to uh, Sweden and he was observing some anatomic dissections. And these were done in the fetus because you can't see the nerves in the, in the adult. And the donker, who was the anatomist, was actually tracing these nerves to the bladder. And Walsh goes, wait a second it looks like those are the nerves that are actually going to the penis for erection. They're passing very close to the prostate. I bet you those nerves are injured. So he came back to Baltimore and he came to Old Reliable and he said, Herb, you're gonna help me solve this puzzle. So I got this specimen and we made 7,000 step sections and eventually I did a three-dimensional reconstruction which had to be done under the microscope to show where the pathway of the nerves and when Wall saw this he said hey look at this these are the nerves for erection they pass very close to the prostate so in most cases where the cancer didn't go through the outer surface sort of invading that tissue he said I believe I could develop an operation that can spare those nerves, remove the cancer, and in many cases preserve the potency. So the anatomic study, I was the lead author, uh, and he was always very good about, about promoting his, uh, uh, his, his students. And so the paper that described how to do the surgery, I was his co-author. And that really sort of set the stage for my becoming an independent surgeon so uh, let's, let's go afterwards. You, how many years did you stay at Hopkins? So I was at Hopkins so four years of med school and then seven years in urology. And then this 20, at that time, 31-year-old, right? Yes, 30, 30, 30, 31. Right. I guess you were 24 when you graduated medical school. I was 24 graduated medical school. And then you had seven 30, years right? over there. Yep. At your, 31, your math is better than mine, at right? At 31, you end up in St. Louis? Yes, yeah, St. Louis. And as the chairman of the department, right? Well, so I wasn't the chairman. So I was the chief of urology of Jewish Hospital of St. Louis, which was a very integral um, uh, part of Washington University. So it was an affiliate. At that time, it wasn't owned by WashU. It was an independent hospital, but it was uh, an integral part of the residency training. So I had a faculty appointment at WashU <clears throat> but I was the chief of urology at Jewish. And then you end up in Milwaukee, right? Oh, God, I ended up in Milwaukee, uh, which was another uh, interesting uh, experience. I was there for, uh, for four years. Uh, as so By then, I was an associate and then a, a, a full professor, so I had sort of moved to the full professor by my by sixth year out. And then I got, I was looking at a couple other chairman positions, I mean, one was at University of Chicago, one was at New York Medical College, but they just didn't quite seem the right job for me. So what uh, happens is 37-year-old uh, guy finds this little <coughs> medical uh, school right. and a medical center, which really was provincial. I mean, right. Dr. Saul was a great person, yeah. but it didn't have its roots. They had great benefactors, they had people, a nice hospital but they didn't have a lot of departments. Yeah, you and know what? It wasn't like Hopkins or WashU where you had tremendous depth. You know, I think if you actually look at NYU, uh, departments that have a real legacy are like neurosurgery. Um, Even and, as you said and to me. And plastic surgery. Plastic right. surgery and dermatology. Right, and because dermatology. Because one of the persons who interviewed you was the late... Uh, Erwin Friedberg. Erwin Friedberg, who was also a Hopkins a person, Hopkins. you said. So I think I told you the story. So when he was on, he ran the search committee. So he calls up Walsh and says, so tell me, who would, you, you know NYU, you know your residents, you know, how do we make a match? And so he says, you call Herb, send a note. This is the perfect job for him. He's young, um, 
maybe a few other uh, complimentary adjectives. And he says, he'll come and turn this place around despite his young age. Don't be discouraged by the fact that he's only, you know, he's only been so, out so, for six years. So 37 years of age, right. you get the job as the chairman of the Department of Urology at, at the NYU yeah. and a professor at the NYU School of Medicine. Correct. And then you create something very interesting. You create a a world-class urology program. Now, part of it was, as we said prior to the show, is that PSA came out early in the 70s or 80s, but nobody really utilized it. Right. And the PSA, was, the, the combination of the PSA test right. and the digital rectal was a way to diagnose prostate cancer, right. which has really done a lot of changes. Right. But, but let's talk a little bit of the practice and what the NYU urological group was because I still remember her before no, I, uh, <laughs> in this little office being the only guy and then there was this crazy guy who was the chairman of the cancer center saying I'm gonna help you and we're gonna do some things well together. well actually when you came in you were actually one of the first person that offered a helping hand you 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 you, you showed up um, at my office and you said you know her uh, you've got a daunting task here but I'm going to help you. And I remember you took me to a couple uh, key folks in the, uh, in the NYU community. In fact, you introduced me to one person who eventually gave us one of the lead gifts. In fact, that turned into a $125,000 a year research annuity. Now, I've been here almost uh, uh, 20 years, actually this year. So you can add up the magnitude of the, uh, uh, of the gift. But you said, I'm going to help you get started. So you've been a real partner with me uh, along the years, referring patients, referring potential donors, and, and I think always sort of feeling a part of the successes that, uh, as you say, you've felt as you've seen right. this department so, grow. So let's, with two minutes, let, let's talk a little bit about family, and then we'll talk about the, okay. the practice. Yes. Uh, when you were in residency, yeah. you met this woman who was a surgeon, right? That woman happens to be now my wife of 30 years. Right. So Ellen, you met, yep. who was one of the first female urologists. She was actually the first woman to complete urology residency at Johns Hopkins in 100 years in 100 years and it was fortuitous because we were on the same service. But she was a year ahead of you. She was a year ahead of me and you know what happens Michael then we didn't have these work restrictions you worked hundreds of hours and so we were on the same service and for the first two weeks I wasn't so fond of her but then obviously the attraction grew and as we say by shared so the next rotation she was at City Hospital and I was at Johns Hopkins in the ER and we're going to be on or off together. Now let's talk about the kids. Yeah, two beautiful kids. Two, okay, Abby. Abby and Lauren. Abby's 14, uh, Lauren is nine. And people tell me anytime I start talking about them, the smile comes out. They are fab. They say they keep me young. <laughs> I'm not sure. They keep me on my toes. <laughs> but they're great kids. And, uh, you know, they, 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 they add such a balance and a enjoyment to life. So with like 30 seconds left, what's going to happen in the future for prostate cancer? You know what I think, Michael, what we're going to do is we're going to get better imaging. So rather than poking the prostate and not knowing what we're dealing with, we're going to get imaging. It's going to show us where the cancer is and then we're going to stick a little laser or something and destroy that one area and we're going to solve the problem of overdiagnosis and overtreatment. And we're going to still see that decline in mortality without all of this overtreatment. So it's going to happen soon. I'm so happy you're here. I'm happy that I've been your friend. And thanks for being here today. Michael, you're immense. Okay.